Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I thought I would talk in this video, just um, keep it as an educational video, completely about one topic, and that topic is the Arctic Ocean bathymetry. Okay, how deep is the water in the Arctic Ocean? Where are the ridges? Where are the trenches? Um, how is it possible that um, for two periods in the last 150,000 years, the Arctic Ocean became completely fresh water. This is a new finding, paper just recently out. We know that the Arctic was completely fresh water during parts of the Carboniferous period, for example, when the Earth was much warmer overall. There was no snow and ice in the Arctic. There were forests growing. There were turtles and crocodiles, alligators, whatever, swimming in the, in the warm water. Lots of algae growth, lots of Azola, I think is one of the algae types. Okay, so, but, but back in the Carboniferous, Carboniferous period, the uh, continents were in different places, of course. But in terms of understanding today's changes in the Arctic and how they will impact global ocean and atmospheric patterns, the bathymetry of the Arctic is very important. For example, a lot of the area that is ice-free year-round now, um, like in the Laptev Sea and the Kara Sea, that's over a continental shelf. Methane being released from the Arctic um, is occurring more and more as the water over the continental shelves warms. And it's warmed over some of these shelves by up to five degrees Celsius. And that's starting to warm the sediments underneath where the methane clath clathrates are, are stored. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to talk all about the bathymetry, just how do you find out the bathymetry of locations in the Arctic, and you can do that for, of course, for any part of the, any part of the planet. Okay, so first step is you just go to Google Images and Google Arctic Ocean Bathymetry, and you can see the images. So for example, here's a, this is a great image of a, th a 3D map. Okay, so it brings me to this website when I click on that bathymetry chart and it has a lot of different other charts showing the topography, etc. Here's the scale. Um, there's some GIS uh, maps where you can go on, around and, and select different layers like uh, physical oceanography, etc. Uh, this is showing sea ice thickness. Um, this is a breathing earth, the heartbeat. So. This is the snow cover over land as a function of the seasons, okay, throughout the year. So you can see, you know, and we talk a lot about the albedo of the Arctic changing, and that's because of the snow cover, but also the, the sea ice. We mostly talk about the sea ice. We, we often, we don't talk as much about the snow cover, but it has just as big as an impact. So this is that map. So it shows you the different deep basins. These are the continental shells that are massive. Um, and uh, the clathrates underneath escaping. Most of the methane can bubble up through the water column and just get into the atmosphere. This is the Fram Strait, and this is the um, region here from Greenland over to Scotland off the map. So this entire ocean in the here and here became fresh water for, the, for a couple periods of time. And I'm gonna talk about the paper also, the topography is very important on the ocean circulation, obviously. Okay, so let's get more information on bathymetry. I just clicked on this image and it identifies everything and shows you the bridges and so on. Uh, but I want to get more detailed information. So I can found this site, the National Centers for Environmental Information, the NOAA site. And this shows you all the surveys that were done of water depth various ship crossings, some regions highly, you know, look at these regions, these are done highly, these must be areas where they're hoping to drill for fossil fuels, and that's why they've done almost complete coverage. You know, look at the crisscross pattern, so ships went up and did soundings in all these regions, you know, so you can clearly tell what they're up to and, and where, you know, here and here and here and here. These are all probably fossil fuel companies, I'm bet betting, and then the water depth is here, uh, but still, I'd like to get more information, more hands-on information. So here we go. Now, you probably know about Google, about Google Earth, right? 
you know, if you haven't, Google Google Earth and play around with it. It's great for topography on land. Now, what most people don't realize is there's a Google Ocean, if you like. You know, just actually Google Google Earth, but say Google, uh, but search for beth ocean bathymetry. So, so in Google, put type Google Earth bathymetry, ocean bathymetry, and you come to this site. Okay, so this is the seafloor depth in, you know, we can have it in feet or meters. And you've got like a global, a, a Google, uh, Google Earth interface. So let's have a look at the Arctic, okay? So let's look up here. This is the Bering Strait and the Chukchi Sea, okay? The Bering Sea out here. And you can see the water depth. So when you, it just gives you latitude and longitude and the height of the camera. But when you zoom in, then it comes to meters. This gives you the water depth. So if we come across the Bering Strait, the water depth, you can see. Okay, you can see. Now, why are the positive numbers? That's a good question. Not completely. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's zoom in right here. You can see some artifacts here. Okay, so minus 35 meters. Okay, this is the water depth. This is about 40 meters, 30, 40 so when the sea level's down, whoop, here we go, minus 37 meters. It thinks I'm on land now. Okay, I can zoom right in. Okay, so it gives you, oh, there's deeper water there. Okay, so when the sea level is down, this is, there's basically a land bridge across here. There's no connection of the Pacific Ocean to the Arctic Ocean. Okay, here. And if you go down to the ridges here, the Canadian archipelago, all these islands and stuff, you know, you can see some deeper channels from um, near Strait here. But if you focus down, you can get the water depth in meters. Okay, so ice shelves coming across, going extending into the water, plus 130 meters sea level rise, completely chalk closed off completely uh, closed off during the peak of the Ice Age. This is the, you know, 60 to 70,000 years ago. And, uh, and uh, 130 to 150,000 years ago. Now here's a choke point here from Greenland to um, the archipelago Svalbard here over to Europe. Okay, you can see the water's deeper here. So this is, this is the Fram Strait coming down here. Okay, so the, we're looking at connections to the rest of the ocean. So here, you know, it's pretty deep. Okay, so 2,000, 3,000 meters, you know, these areas here, 3,500 meters. Okay, so it's very, very deep in this section. So there's no way this can be blocked off by floating Ice, ice, ice shelves. Even if they're really, really thick, there's no way, this is always going to be open. Okay, so the conditions here and the conditions here, there's interchange of water, so it'll be similar. But this whole region, looking at seafloor sediments in the peak of the, um, the coldest parts of the ice ages, this was completely fresh water and this was completely fresh water. And we know from looking for thorium in the seafloor sediments. And I'm going to talk about that peer-reviewed paper in great detail because it's crucial. It's new information and it's crucial. This is where they say the choke point is, from Greenland to Scotland. Okay, so let's look at the water depth here. Now, it only gives a depth if you focus in closer. So let's have a look here. So where is the channel here? This is the narrowest part right here, the shallowest part right here. So let's have a look. Okay, so 500, 630 meters. Okay, so about 630 meters. Sea level was 130 meters lower. So that's now going to, the depth there when sea level is 130 meters lower is 500 meters. Okay, yet we know that we had ice shelves coming from both sides that were 900 meters thick. So only um, floating, so only um 10 percent of the 900 meters 90 meters above sea level and over 800 meters below sea level 
well, the water's only going to be 500 meters, right? So the 630 minus 130. So 500 meters. So basically, the ice, it's not an ice shelf. The, well, it's not floating. It's going to be grounded on bedrock, and there's going to be no water coming through this passageway here. So let's look at the other passage here as we go over to Scotland. Where is the other deepest spots? So this is super shallow stuff. You know, maybe out here there's some deeper water. Okay, 400 meters. Still pretty shallow, right? So take away 130 meters for the sea level lowering, and you don't, you need, and the ice is going to be forming here and shelves coming off, forming here, shelves coming off. This is completely blocked off too. Maybe there's some flow through here. You know, there's a narrow part right here. Okay, again, water's not that deep. Or if you go across here, you know, the water is deeper. Maybe some water's getting, there's eight, I saw 800 meters. 800, 900. Okay, so this is a, over a kilometer deep. So maybe some water, some water will still be coming through here, right? The ice lower, subtract 130 meters. And if you, that's for sea level change. And if you've got 800 meter thick ice extending to the bottom, then there's going to be some space for the water to get through. But, you know, if you follow this part here and follow this ridge here, you know, it looks like the water is essentially closed off. So the, this whole Arctic Ocean region is therefore, um, it's not connected to the Pacific or the Atlantic. All the fresh water is coming in, building up, building up. Some of the salt water must be pushed out. And we've got a completely fresh Arctic Ocean. Amazing. Like, it's pretty obvious, right? Now that you know it, it's pretty obvious. So this is a great tool anyway uh, for, you know, what else do we want to look at, uh, for example? Uh, you know, you can, uh, this is very good if you're interested in finding where the methane clathrate regions are. You know, if you want to look at the, let's go to the U.S. coast, for example. Let's look at the Gulf of Mexico. You know, you can, so it, it's very, very, very useful information to get the ocean floor depth. I know, uh, here, here's Bermuda here, little Bermuda, one of my favorite places in the world. And, you know, the water is very, very deep around here. This is probably the right out here, yeah. Okay, all around, it's very, very deep. In fact, they, they don't have to go very far off Bermuda, you know, to get away from the reefs. This is, this is uh, the, the reefs here are all no deeper than most of them are about 30, 10 meters deep or something. 10 meters, 9 meters, 10 meters. A little bit. It, it, the water gets deeper off the south shore faster. So still 10 meters, a couple hundred meters. It drops off, and then it drops off the cliff into the abyss. Okay, so play around with this. Hudson's Bay, pretty pretty shallow. Pretty shiny. There, it's po it's a hundred meters above sea level here. Really? Okay, so there's some issues, <laughs> some issues with it. But you know, it's very very useful. Um, you know, if you live on New Zealand, for example, there you go, get the bathymetry. Right? It looks like like rivers and stuff. So what happens is the sediment goes down these pathways and can get gouged out. But anyway, the bathymetry is very, very important uh, knowledge, and it's a fantastic interface for getting the bathymetry of the planet. Um, so the key thing for the next video is that when this is ice covered and when sea level is 130 meters lower, there's no connection and, and thick ice grounded on the seafloor. There's no connection to the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean. This is this be, over time. This becomes completely fresh water, and then when the ice melts back, this fresh water hoses out and causes the abrupt climate changes that we see. This is new information that this was completely fresh water. It changes changes everything. Really, really important paper. Okay, I'll I'll get to that paper next video. Thanks for listening.